Hi, I'm Kelsey Brennan Wessels, and welcome to this special edition of Earth from Space on the European Space Agency Web TV. We're joining you today from the Living Planet Symposium in Prague, and I'm joined by Wolfram Mauser, who is the chairman of the Earth Science Advisory Committee for ESA. Now, of course, at this conference, we are talking about Earth observation satellite data, looking at some of the results that are coming out of these missions that are flying about 800 kilometers above our head. Now, ESA has the Earth Explorer missions. Those are GOCE, Cryosat, SMOS, and SWARM. Uh, four missions. Um, can you begin by telling me a bit about GOCE? Of course, that's the only one that's already been deorbited. The other three missions are still in orbit. What sort of data came out of GOCE? GOCE was uh, originally planned to measure the gravitational field of the Earth. Now, we think that the Earth is, 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 is a ball in space, which is round like an apple, or which is even rounder than an apple, but it isn't. The, the gravitation is very varying across the globe. And to know this information very exactly is extremely important, not only for our cell phones to know where they are and how high the elevation is, but also for the currents of, uh, of the, the, the sea, of the uh, oceans, because the currents flow according to gravity and not according to height. They flow where the gravity is larger and they flow away from where the gravity is not as large. And this is what Goche has been measuring with an, uh, an accuracy that has never been done before. Now this crosses over a bit with the Cryosat mission as well. Yes, the Cryosat mission uh, is also an explorer mission that is still up there and it's measuring uh, the ice sheets on the globe and the ice sheets on, on in, the, in the very north and the very south in the, uh, in the Arctic and, uh, and Antarctic, they are changing drastically due to climate change but also due to seasonal uh, influences so so the, the the Arctic is constantly varying its its uh, its uh, cover its ice cover with the seasons and at the same time you can study with cryosat how this is changing every year due to climate change because it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer at the same time you measure very exactly the height of the ocean with cryosat and if you combine this with the Gosha data all of a sudden you can see how the currents flow in the ocean you can see the, 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 um, uh, uh, the big current that flows from the U.S. Uh, uh, to Europe, which is called the Gulf Stream, which is uh, transporting tremendous amounts of energy to us so that it's warmer here than in other places at the same latitudes. So we can try understanding this by comparing these, me these measurements of, of a combined uh, Goshi and Cryosat of the ocean currents, combine this with our models, compare this with our models and see whether the models understand this. This is very important to understand climate change because most of the energy on the globe is stored in the oceans and is transported around in the oceans. So if we want to understand this more clearly to see what we can do against climate change in the future uh, in terms of adaptation or mitigation, we have to understand these subtle differences that, that these explorers give us. Okay, and SMOS is also looking at oceans. SMOS is also looking at oceans, but not only, it's also looking at land. It's looking at oceans in, term the, uh, in terms of the salinity of the oceans. The salt content of the oceans is measured by, uh, by SMOS as much as the soil moisture on the land surfaces. Now you may think, uh, what do they have in common? So why can, can SMOS measure both of them? It's the same phenomenon. It's the same phenomenon that, that you look at water and you look at the changing um, uh, properties of water. If water is in the soil and it's getting less and less and less, the soil is changing its property that's called dielectric constant. This is changed by less and less and less water. Uh, and the same happens, the dielectric constant is changing uh, in the oceans when the salinity is changing. Now every time water flows into the ocean through the Amazon, for example, which is a sweet water, the largest sweet water lake on the globe, uh, sweet water uh, river on the globe, sorry, um, now, every time this releases water into the ocean, it's diluted, the water in the ocean, and it's changing its density. So all of a sudden, this water is, is not the same as the other water, so, so the waters are mixing. And this is important to know the energy constant, uh, content of, of, uh, of the oceans around the globe. What is important on land is soil moisture because the plants live from that, and we live from the plants. So if there is not enough soil moisture, plants die. And if we know this in advance, how much soil moisture is stored in the soils, we can make predictions about how much can be harvested at the end of the season. And this is important uh, for support and help uh, and, and other activities that we can give to, for example, 
uh, countries in Africa uh, that are now, as we are standing here, heavily affected uh, by El Nino and, and the lack of, of, uh, of rainfall that they had over the last months. So we can expect that there, there will be trouble coming up in feeding all people down there in, in these countries and we have to prepare a support as soon as possible, as soon as we can see from the satellite information that there is not enough water in the ground. Now let's look at the latest Earth Explorer mission that's been launched at SWARM. What sort of information is SWARM providing? SWARM is measuring the magnetic field of the Earth. The magnetic field is, is produced by, by, by liquid metals inside of the Earth that, that move around and that, that act like a dynamo and, and that produce currents and then you have a magnetic field. Now this is very diverse and this is very complicated how these metals move around in, 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 in the interior of the Earth and, and you cannot look in, inside there, you can only look at what comes out of it and this is the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is changing constantly and it's also of very practical use to us because uh, we have to know since centuries where north is and uh, we can do this with a magnetic sensor. And, uh, but it's not really north and it's changing all the time. So we have to measure this, uh, this field. And at the same time, measuring these very, very small differences that you can measure with SWARM uh, gives you the chance to understand how this, how this field is changing over time. And maybe to predict how this field will change in the future and understand how this field is built up and what's, what's happening inside of the, inside of the Earth. Um, this is also affecting climate indirectly because this magnetic field is capturing uh, the, the particles that come from the sun, the high energy particles that come from the sun, is capturing them and, and, and it's, it's diverting them towards certain places on the globe where you can see the, 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 the northern light, I think you call it, uh, this, uh, these shiny lights in, at night uh, and where you can see these particles. But it also affects uh, clouds, the formation of clouds, and indirectly through this, it, it, is, it, it influences climate. And we have to understand this to be able uh, to adapt uh, to climate change in the right way and also to mitigate climate change in the future so that we come up with a two degrees uh, uh, corridor, as we said in Paris at the COP21. Now looking to the future, what sort of scientific challenges do we face or even societal changes that we face where satellite data can help? I think one of the, one of the greatest challenges that we have is feeding uh, nine, million, 9 billion people in the future. We will be 9 billion people by the year 2050 and we will need for feeding them adequately. We will probably need twice as much food as we have today. And, 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 and the planet will not expand. So, so we, we will have to find ways to sustainably, and this is important, sustainably uh, produce the food that we need for 9 billion people. We cannot afford to destroy the, the, the soil on which we plant our, our plants. So we have to find ways to, to uh, exactly, uh, and much more exactly than today, produce our food. And this is something that where satellites can help us tremendously uh, in, in uh, watching the plants as they grow, seeing pests before we see them so that we can minimize uh, I the, the chemicals that we use to, to fight the pests, uh, optimizing uh, the fertilizer that we use so that we have uh, huge yields and at the same time minimum impacts on, on, on the environment so that we have a clean environment and at the same time have an agriculture that feeds the globe. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, disasters. We have, to, we have to develop a more secure society in the future. Because only a more secure society will be a society that will not expand as they do today. Uh, if you can rely on the future, you will not have that many children. So we have to, in advance, find ways to know where the catastrophes will be happening and prepare ourselves, prepare the society for this. And uh, remote sensing data from satellites helps us tremendously in learning how to do that and eventually being able on an operational basis to do that. Wolfram, thank you so much for joining us today. And to our viewers, remember that you can learn more about space or about our living planet by going to our website at www.esa.int.